Welcome to Hackbits, where we cover a variety of cybersecurity subjects. Join your host, Gaspar Martirano, as he interviews cybersecurity experts and discusses the latest cybersecurity news, trends, data breaches, and updates on state-sponsored cybercrime. Hello, and I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, our addition, new edition of uh, Hackbits uh, podcast. So I have a very special guest today. I have uh, Alan Heyman. Uh, he is the CEO of uh, SMLR Group. Uh, Alan has over 25 years experience in data communications. Uh, he had started one of the first internet-based uh, electronic data exchange companies in the late 80s. He's recognized as an expert in social media policies, procedures, privacy matters, and cybersecurity compliance. His company has a comprehensive approach to social media privacy and cybersecurity needs, encompassing legal, IT, engineering, um, HR, cybersecurity software, and cyber uh, insurance. He is a lecturer, columnist, and he's a certified by IBM uh, Internet Security Solutions Group in all phases of IT and cybersecurity. Alan, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. So um, we'll, we'll jump right into it. Um, I had to look it up myself. Uh, uh, one of the things we wanted to talk about was uh, what is NYDFS? And, um, you know, I had to, to go online and look into it because uh, I think you had told me it's not a very known uh, entity and most people don't know it exists. And, it, and NYDFS stands for what? Stands for New York Department of Financial Services. There are a specific number of companies that have to be licensed to the DFS, and it's a very uh, closed environment, although the state is increasing the number of types of companies that have to be certified. This involves all uh, property and casualty brokers, health insurance brokers, uh, public adjusters, mortgage brokers, loan money people, uh, anything that has to have a license from New York State in order to do business within New York State. Although it's kind of interesting, even though they have licenses in New York State, it doesn't apply to people who are in New York State. It always applies to where the customer is. So if you are a Jersey company licensed to the New York Department of Financial Services and you have clients in New York, you are subject to their ruling. I have a couple of clients from Lloyd's London that have to be certified by the Department of Financial Services. Interesting. So tell me a little bit about, about your business and how what your role is in it. And I, uh, specifically, what is the role in licensing when it comes to cybersecurity policy? So explain to me kind of how what your company does and then what the role in licensing uh, when it comes to cybersecurity uh, is. Well, it became kind of interesting. Uh, I did a lot of IT work in, in my life, and one of my large clients received this notification three years ago that their licensing entity, the DFS, was going to require them to do cybersecurity compliance. And they didn't know the first thing about it, and they didn't know who to turn to, so they gave it to me to look at, and I saw immediately that this was a revolutionary turn on cybersecurity because it was not IT-oriented was compliance oriented and it was rather new because the ruling which was about 40 pages had two paragraphs on IT requirements the rest were in certifications who you were what type of company you were once they determined the size of your company all your people had to be licensed you had to register your people on an annual basis you had to then do compliance on an annual basis you had to certify on an annual basis that your company was compliant with all the rules and regulations, which again, were all written documentation. And it really was the beginning in the United States on requirements of cybersecurity, not from IT, but from requirements. Did you have a uh, plan in place? Did your clients, did you notify your employees what has to get done? Were all your compliant people notified what they had to get done? What were their requirements legally so that the you were required to do this? And every year they cranked up what the requirements are. They're now just getting into the IT side with Google authentication. But everybody has to be certified. 
and they've gotten a very good computer system in place so that as you register on an annual basis, it matches up against your license renewal. And if you don't have everything in place, you don't get your license renewal. That's interesting. Is there is there a limitation as is, is a certain size companies? Because I know there was a checklist that was uh, that was I, I've seen floating around online that kind of gave some guidance on what companies need to do. And one of the things I found interesting in that checklist was um, that there was a, a you know one of the things said to appoint a chief uh, appoint a uh, a CISO a chief information security officer. Right. And the first thing that popped into my mind is well, not everyone could afford one. So is there a, is there a size limitation or how does that work? The size of the business itself has something to do with it. It's rather confusing, but once you understand it, somebody within the company has to be designated as the chief information officer. For smaller companies, it's usually the owner. Larger companies have to have a full-time CISO in place who has requirements to meet all the certifications in place. What gets confused is that the limitations are 10 employees or less, uh, 5 million in sales, 10 million in assets. That makes you an exempt company, which makes everybody think if they are in those parameters, they're exempt, but they're really not exempt. What has happened is a company that is beyond those have to meet all the certifications, which is about 17. A company that is exempt has to meet maybe seven to eight, but they still have to do documentation. They still have to have somebody appointed to be responsible, not necessarily a registered CISO, but someone has to be appointed to be responsible but making sure that all the requirements are met. Interesting. So companies from one employee to 10,000 have to be certified. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Because I know, you know, sometimes you'll see some rules out there that don't apply to companies of of certain sizes. And this one uh, applies to everyone, regardless of who you are. So uh, what size you are. So what, what, what entities are affected by the rulings? Like, tell me some of the, some of the, who's affected by some of the stuff that they, they rule. Uh, there's uh, 19 different uh, industries that have to be licensed by the Department of Financial Services. The biggest is the property and casualty brokers, any kind of insurance broker, uh, public adjusters, uh, pawn brokers, money lenders, people who exchange money, loan money, things like that, mortgage brokers, anybody that's licensed by the DFS has to be compliant. And what's confusing, and I'll repeat myself, is even though they say you're exempt, you're exempt from certain rules and regulations, but you still have a series of about seven to eight requirements you must have, such as you must have a plan in place as to what your people are going to do and what your company is going to do if you do have a breach. Now, this is uh, 2021 when this came into existence in 2017. It was really revolutionary. And the fines are just starting to come in. The first few fines have been rather dramatic. Uh, there was a company, a mortgage broker, that got hit with a fine and they thought it was going to be about $50,000. They settled out of court for a million and a half. Wow. Imagine how large, how large it was. Another company just settled out of court also for about a million dollars. So they don't play games. Uh, they could, they, they, what are some of the requirements that they, that they uh, issue that are issued by the DFS? Uh, primarily documentation. You have to have dual authentication. You have to have a plan in place as to what the policies of the company are is of the cybersecurity as it pertains to employees and clients. You have to have a uh, program in place as to what are you going to do, how you're going to handle things. You have to have uh, all your rules and regulations. Everybody within the company has to sign off saying they are knowledgeable of what has to be done, where to go. Uh, Most important, and this is really the, the one that makes it very difficult, if you are breached, you must report it online and you have 72 hours to report that breach to the DFS. Once you report it, you're pretty much guaranteed of being audited within the next year. year, year. 
Wow. The only thing that's held them back right now from being more proactive has been COVID and the lack of personnel. Um, but before we go on with some other questions I have, I'm just really curious. Do other states have similar, uh, uh, you know, uh, organizations in place, or, or is it is it just really unique to New York State? New York started the ball rolling, and then they came in uh, last year with what is called the Shields Act. The Shields Act is something that covers not only licensed companies but all companies that conduct business with New York State residents, regardless of where the company is located. California is uh, also extremely active in this with their protection laws also that require full-time uh, CISOs in place. They call them a data manager. Uh, South and North Carolina have uh, things on the book. The uh, Insurance Institute has put together a model plan that uh, companies, uh, that uh, states can just pick up and put in something in place that emulates the New York program. But it's been slow going because of COVID, but I expect it to pick up very dramatically because the only way the, the state can really put together a plan to protect people is with regulation. And rather than go ahead and develop their own, they're copying what New York State is doing and what California is doing. In other locations, primarily in the educational area, they're using the NIST standard, National Institute of uh, Science and Technology, to establish plans. And the federal government has also started to pass rulings that if you do business with the DOD, you must be compliant to their NIST requirements, which is a document that's about 90 pages long. Interesting. So... What are their enforcement policies? I mean, do, do, do they do they have teeth in them? Like you did talk a little bit about the fines. Is there anything else that, that they can do and, and to enforce their policies on, on businesses? Well, what's, what's most interesting is that, uh, first of all, to the DFS, you have to make a ruling. You have to go on every year, and you have to do a certificate that you have been compliant. Uh, if you have a breach and you have not said that you've been compliant, you're in violation of your own law. So that's the first thing that they get you on. Second, they're starting to do more and more global work in regards to ruling that cross match with each other. If you do the Shields Act and you are on a DFS, you don't have to do the Shields Act. It gets kind of confusing the legalities and such are all compliant, and right now the most stringent requirements of any of these companies that you hear about breaches is the first thing that the insurance companies do is they look to see that if you are compliant with the bodies of law that you are required to be. For example, if you're a property casualty broker and you are not up to speed with your compliance requirements, your cybersecurity insurance could be in question. Uh, the law always says on the insurance policies that you have to be compliant with all segments of the law or else the policies can be pulled. So this is getting to have a lot of crossover across the board with many companies. Sure. So for a good segue into my next question. So are all companies treated equally with this? Uh, are, are they all treated equally across the board? companies are treated more stringently at this moment. The Shields Act, which is coming in, uh, is for all companies. They're not as stringent as the DFSs, so that the annual requirements and the 72-hour requirement is most significant under the DFS rulings. Um, I just saw in the paper that New York, that federal government is trying to make rulings uh, to do a 72-hour ruling also, which when you think about it, most companies who are breached don't even know they're breached. And to be able to report that they're breached within 72 hours is an enormous burden. Uh, as a result, the first thing that you have to do is if you think you're breached, and I 
have, I take maybe three quarters of my clients who think they're breached are not breached. Uh, computers were working properly, systems were down. Right now with the ransomware, uh, everybody gets very nervous. So don't run to the DFS to report. You gotta bring in a professional. Very often you have what is called a breach coach, an attorney who can come in and because of the client attorney privilege, you can put a stop on that 72 hours till you determine whether you physically had a breach. And the breach is now legally defined as what the aspects of a breach are. Just saying that somebody broke into your system is not sufficient. You have to have an ability not to use your system. Your system has to be down. The information has to be taken or the presumption of information has to be taken. You have to have an ability not to use your system before you declare it as an actual breach. And the insurance carriers are getting very careful also because there so many ransomware attacks are now causing them to pay out so much money. Now they're taking it very, very seriously and making sure that you have all your documentation in place, all your requirements in place before they bring in uh, the government they first go to a breach coach who takes over the responsibilities of notifying whether there is a breach or not. That's great. So I only have a couple more questions. Our time's running out. But what are their annual reporting requirements? So what is it like for a company? Uh, is it a, is it a big burden, or how how you know can anyone do it? At, at first, it was. Now they've got it very computerized. On the DFS, uh, you have to register all employees. So everybody with a license has to have registered with the DFS. If you work for a company, you have to register and show that you work for that company. If you leave that company and go someplace else, you have to remove yourself from that company, and then you have to go to the new company, uh, or else your requirements are up for yourself. You have to do a certification every year that you are in compliant with all the DFS requirements, and you have to do that annually every, uh, of course of COVID, they've changed the date, but it's supposed to be every February 15th. You have to have everything in place. That may change because again, COVID has caused a lot of problems. But it's an annual reporting requirement. Excellent. So um, just to wrap it up, just tell me a little about your business and what exactly you do for your clients and, uh, you know, how can they reach you? Um, I uh, handle uh, the compliance. I can come to me and I bring together all your compliance requirements and put together all your compliance requirements. Uh, the best way to reach me is uh, by email, ahayman at smlrgroup.com com or my office number 917-833-6591. I've created a audit book concept, which we've copyrighted, so that a client comes in and we put together an entire book in anticipation of the audit. We don't make the assumption that if there's going to be an audit, that's your time to run around like a crazy person. You make sure you have all your documents in place and all your requiring documents, and then we do uh, simulated audits on an annual basis to make sure the client is up to date since the laws are constantly changing and tightening up on a regular basis. I'm in the Northeast, uh, New York, but uh, I have clients all over the world. Again, Alan, I really, really appreciate taking the time explaining it. This was fascinating. Uh, it's it's kind of something where, um, you know, you learn something new every day. Uh, it's kind of amazing that this is going on, uh, that it exists. And I think that uh, many people um, really don't have a uh, uh, an educated view on what kind of some of the some of the compliance issues that that businesses uh, in New York State can run into. Uh, so I really appreciate taking the time kind of explaining it all and giving a great overview on, um, you know, what, what businesses need to deal with and, and how, uh, you know, making sure that you're compliant is, is an important factor in just running your company. I appreciate your time. If anybody has any questions, because it is a, a, a difficult area, uh, it's a uh, lot of legality, a lot of negligence considerations, uh, the wording of the laws are kind of confusing. 
conflicted and confusing. So if anybody has any questions, I offer a free one-hour consulting uh, service at no charge. That's great. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Thank you.